Welcome to Oscar Sunday. I'm Austin Johnson. I'm Connor Izagiri. And today we are going to be talking about a film that defines the word classic. It's The Wizard of Oz from 1939, which was nominated five times at the 12th Academy Awards. Uh, you could say six if you count the juvenile award that Judy Garland won. Uh, that's an award that doesn't really exist anymore. I kind of wish it did in a way, maybe name it something different. I think it'd be really cool if there was a award for kind of like a breakthrough performance at the Oscars or a under 15 performance, something like that. I, I think it would be cool to kind of recognize people that might end up taking over at some point. Cause this, this award lasted for, I don't know, like 15 years. And, you know, like she, Judy Garland won, Mickey Rooney won, won, you know, these are people that like end up having really cool careers. So I think it's kind of a neat thing. Uh, I wish it still existed, but technically I would say it's only five nominations if you're counting categories that have lasted forever in the the oscars um the wizard of oz for myself this is a film uh, i hadn't seen in years and was not a movie that like was a part of my childhood so it's been something that my parents both really liked but i just they never really pushed it onto me and, and so i never really took that leap right or never really watched it with them so it's been something i've kind of grown to enjoy on my own and God, what a fucking weird, wacky, crazy movie <laughs> that, that still stands the test of time. So, Connor, I know you have a deeper connection to it, so I'd like to hear your general thoughts on, on The Wizard of Oz and kind of what it means to you. Well, this is, uh, this is a film that's been in my family for generations. I, um, you know, I've talked often about how I grew up with a lot of 80s movies because my mom and dad were big into 80s movies. They had their VHS collection that kind of became my VHS collection. But on top of that, my grandparents had their films that they loved that they showed me. And The Wizard of Oz is one of my grandma's favorite movies. And I've been watching this since I was old enough to have memories. It's a beautiful, fun, enjoyable film that came out of one of the most disastrous productions in cinema history, which is kind of amazing. Uh, that this film, A, worked and B, still works. It's hard to believe. Uh, but it's it's whimsical, it's fun, it's endearing, it's got a good message, and I I still love it. I I can't hate it. It's so much fun. It's I get pepped up by the music. I start singing along. I look forward to certain moments. It makes me laugh. It's just a great movie, and it's one of those films that is going to be around forever, like a thousand years from now. They're still going to be watching The Wizard of Oz. Yeah, yeah, I think. When you think of the 30s, you know, especially in American cinema, I think it's probably the first movie you'd think about. I think, yeah, Wizard of Oz, maybe, maybe it happened one night, but Wizard of Oz is, is one that I think is hard to deny. It's just hard to deny its greatness. And, uh, you know, you spoke about just how it was kind of a, a disaster on set. This movie is it, the way it got made, it's fucking dark. <laughs> yeah. And, and has all kinds of stories coming out of it. You know, we could do a whole episode just just about The Wizard of Oz and what happened, you know, from there being six different directors. Uh, Margaret Hamilton caught on fire at one point uh, while filming and had to take a break for like three months. Yeah. Uh, Ju Judy Garland was being drugged the entire time with uppers, downers, speed, you know, all kinds of crazy shit. She was being abused um, and is sadly enough it's kind of a something that's that that's that's going to happen in her career for the rest rest of the time she's alive she just gets used and abused constantly and i think the wizard of oz is where you know it's this huge huge film where she's young and shining bright in it and behind the scenes is this just really really dark cloud around it so i, I it's just like a fascinating one to to, to think about and kind of read about um you know, cost uh, it cost a shit ton of money to make. Initially, they didn't really make their money back at first. It, it kind of took uh, more waves in the decades to come. Uh, by by the '60s, Wizard of Oz was showing on you know like network television, uh, so families were just seeing it on their tel on their TV on a, you know on a Friday night, and it became this phenomenon. You know, it became this huge, huge monstrous film. And ever since then, you know, I think it just kind of speaks for itself. You know, its legend speaks for itself. And 
a lot of people say the cool the, the cool kind of statistic about the wizard of oz is people will say a lot of like film historians will say it's the most watched movie of all time and that's so cool that is cool and it's one of those films that represents such a landmark like in film history that it was unavoidable for this podcast like we certain films i've, I've said this in the past certain films are going to be talked about. Like we can go outside the box as much as we want, but some films are going to be here. And the wizard of Oz is one of those movies. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It kind of came from an accident. Cause we were, we were going to do Shanghai express, but we couldn't find it. <laughs> yeah. And of course, of course, like a day later you find it at half price books on DVD. So we will do, I want to see Shanghai express. I want to do that on the show. We'll do that at some point later in the year. Uh, I want to, to cover, to tackle more, you know, thirties and forties films as we keep moving forward. And, uh, the thirties, I think the thirties, I think is the decade we've touched the least when it comes to the Oscars yeah. and on this show, on this particular. So I would love to, to tackle more. And, and, you know, next week is the actual Oscars, the 94th Academy Awards. And I think it's fitting to do a movie that just means so much. And then the week after the 94th Academy Awards, we're doing another monstrous, monstrous movie that means so much to, to film history. So we're kind of like sandwiching the real Oscars with these two mega, mega movies. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I think The Wizard of Oz, you know, you know, you could talk about Judy Garland, you could talk about the crazy costume design, the Technicolor, uh, all those things. I think the stuff that stands, stands the strongest now, you know, what, fucking 80 years later, is is the music is the songs is you know these whimsical lyrics and this adventure quality that it has uh it won in the two musical categories right one for best song and best best uh, score and that had me thinking a lot about music this week and i asked you connor to prepare uh, a top five as well of course i prepared a top five as well for Oscar winning scores. Uh, now this, this is an insane category that has evolved so much over time. It's the most adaptable and changing and honestly diverse category in Oscar history, in my opinion. Uh, it's changed names more times than any other category. It's changed the way it looks at music more times than any other category. And it includes different kinds of people more than any other category. Uh, you know, it's, it's composers, it's people making, making songs. And we've seen stretches where musicals dominate and then musicals by, by the seventies and eighties, musicals weren't really, you know, popular anymore. So they stopped counting musicals as, uh, as this thing that needs to be in its own category. Instead, it was just straight up score. And, you know, now we have these amazing composers who have completely changed the game. Uh, Nowadays, guys like Nicholas Bertel, you know, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, uh, these, these people are super important to what we think, you know, Johnny Greenwood, they're super important to what we think about music and movies today. Uh, but it's always, it's always been changing. And I'm super fascinated by that. So typically, if we did top five best actor wins, for example, there would be 93 to choose from, right? Because there's been 93 Academy Awards uh, to, to date. But with this, there's like 140 <laughs> because there, there's been years where they had separate categories. They had a uh, score for dramatic film and then score for musical or comedy, you know, and, and then it changed to just, you know, just this. And uh, during the 90s, four Disney films won for best score. You know, I think it's uh, Aladdin, Pocahontas, Lion King, and uh, the other one escapes me. Um, Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast, yeah. So those four, you know, is the Disney, Disney Renaissance uh, where they just completely start taking over and making amazing films that are up for all kinds of Oscars, including Beauty and the Beast for Best Picture. Uh, and they, they they won so many, you know. That, that's that's thanks to Alan Menken. Uh, and the Oscars were like, okay, hold on, we have to like figure out what does this category mean, what is it exactly? And since two thousand, they've changed it to just five films are up best original score. And there has to be, uh, the, the rule used to be at least, I think 45% of the score had to be completely original music. And then last year they changed it to 60%. 
And then this year they changed it back down to 30 or 35, one of those. So it's, it's always changing. This is something that you can't just uh, talk about in a short amount of time. You kind of have to do your own research on this category and it is fascinating, but you understand uh, the, the task at hand here. It's, it's all about scores that have won. That could be an adapted score. That could be musical score, comedy, drama, whatever it is. As long as it won gold, it can be in your top five. So I'm, I'm, I'm super excited. This is one that I thought about far too much. <laughs> uh, while, I, while I was today, I had it down to 12. You know, I was like, all right, here's my, here's my favorite 12 scores that have won an Oscar. I got to narrow it down to five and I was just swapping them in and out over and over. And then finally I was like, you know what? Go with your heart, <laughs> go with the movies that you love, go with the ones that move you the most, the ones that have been with you the most. And I came, came up with five, five scores and films that I, I completely adore. So super excited. Um, is there anything you want to say about scores before we get started? I just want to preface my list by saying that some of my favorite film composers in history, uh, won't be represented here because they've never won. Uh, mm, Thomas yeah, Newman, yeah. Danny Elfman, Carter Burwell, like these guys don't have a win and regrettably could not appear on these lists. But, you know, narrowing down five winners is tough. And these really just represent five scores that I personally adore, that I believe deserve the gold and represent the greatness of these films. So mm. this is just the best that I could do. These aren't the best of all time. These are just my best. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. Trust me. The first two that came to my mind when I thought of top five scores was uh, Nicholas Patel's Moonlight um, score, which didn't win. And then uh, Lost to La La Land, Justin Hurwitz. And then uh, 2007, Johnny Greenwood, There Will Be Blood, wasn't even nominated. So uh, it's unfortunate, right? Uh, Carter Burwell is such a good shout out because he's just as important to the Cohen filmography, just like the Coens are. So he's, a, he's his own character in all of their movies. Um, so I, I love that. I, I love that we're kind of in the same place where it's like, okay, this doesn't mean these are our five favorites of all time or anything. It's just picking amongst a pool of films because if we did top five scores ever, come on, I'm going to, I'm going to lose my goddamn mind. That Honestly, means I gotta, don't that think means I can do that. Neither, neither could I. We got to take into account, you know, Bernard, Bernard Herman, you know, taxi driver and citizen fucking Kane. Like, I don't think I want to do that. So I don't want to do that to myself. I, I like that we had a pool of a certain amount of films to choose from. So yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun, man. What's your number five? My number five, uh, honestly might've made my list simply because it's been on my mind a lot lately, but when I look back on it, it really is a terrific film and an amazing score. Uh, 1952's high noon by Dimitri mm. Tomkin. Oh, that barely missed my cut. I love High Noon. <laughs> and you know what's cool about High Noon is the song used in Belfast, the, the film. Yeah. Just just from yeah, you know, from from this past year, from 2021, a film that's up for best picture. That was so cool. I got chills when that when that when that was queued up. Yeah. I saw it in theaters by myself and I was like one of the few people in there. And when that came on, I was like, oh shit. Like I yeah. got I got jazzed. Yeah. Awesome, man. Do not um, forsake me, oh my darlings. <laughs> high Noon, take it away. I love that movie. Well, I just finished reading this book, uh, High Noon, The Hollywood Blacklist and the Making of an American Classic. So Very nice. High Noon's just been rolling around in my head for the past month um, and learning about how the, the score was produced. It was built all around this song, Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling. And you can feel this intense, like just reliance on time throughout this movie because of this the score that's constantly pushing that song back and just making you feel tense and fearful of what exactly is going to happen the first time you watch this you it's not your traditional western you're thinking like anything could really happen here like gary cooper could die like this could this could end horribly or it could end mm. beautifully you don't know and the music kind of pushes you in either direction throughout uh and dimitri tomkin was such an um, amazing composer way ahead of his time uh, accused of communism, as was almost everybody on this set. Uh, I found out screenwriter Carl Foreman, who this was his baby, got kicked off production by Stanley Kramer, producer, for being uh, like for being invited to uh, testify before the HUAC. He later won an Oscar for Bridge on the River Kwai. It was not given to him because he was a he was blacklisted communist. Didn't get that back till like the day before he died. It's a whole crazy story about High Noon. I recommend looking that up. It's wild. This movie 
did not happen the traditional way. And really, you can kind of thank Gary Cooper for holding all that shit together. But yeah. wonderful score. I wanted to start this out with, with this movie, uh, a quintessential Western and American classic and a phenomenal score. Yeah, that's such a good pick. I uh, thought about that one for a long time. I love, love, love High Noon. And I've, I felt when we did the episode on High Noon, I felt like honored to even to even speak about Gary Cooper and that movie and what it means uh, and how, like you said, it's, it's, it's one of those films where the plot, it never, never feels predictable. It never feels predictable where it's going to go. And that is so tough to find at that time in Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, good, good shout out. That's such a good one to start with. Uh, and has become high noons become this film that I, I liked. And then I was like, okay, wait a minute. This is some of the best shit I've ever seen. And it's certainly like one of my favorite fifties movies of all time. So, uh, yeah, good, good start. That's probably my number six, seven or eight, somewhere in there. It's right outside. I cut it today and I was like, oh, that's so hard to do. So I'm really glad you have it. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good feeling. Um, my number five, I'll be kind of shocked if you don't have this on your list. So if you do, uh, we'll just, you know, s- save your thoughts on it for later. But um, I, yeah, I'd be, I'd be kind of shocked if you don't have it. It's uh, Lord of the Rings Return of the King by Howard Shore. Uh, Christ Almighty, you know, uh, I'm a huge, huge fan of, of Lord of the Rings, as we both are. We did it for our episode 50 on this show. Uh, Howard Shore is the fucking man. My favorite film from the trilogy is, is Fellowship of the Ring, which also got Howard Shore the win for Best Original Score. But when you listen to both scores, you know, Fellowship, you know, because it's kind of this origin movie and it's getting you kind of settled in and introducing you to characters, it's got a lot of, uh, and I, I don't want to sound, sound, like, sound like a child, but it's got a lot of more slower moments in the score, uh, Fellowship of the Ring. Return of the King is like banger after banger after banger after banger. It's like listening to a Kendrick Lamar album. You're just like, whoa, holy shit. This guy is just churning it out over and over. My favorite track is, uh, is uh, She Loves Lair. I adore, adore that piece of music. And I mean, you just can't go wrong. You know, uh, when the, the black gates open, that, that music is just like, oh my God. You know, it's just, it, it's just appalling. It's my favorite piece of return of the king is is the score and then Viggo mortensen <laughs> you know those are my two favorite things about return of the king uh great movie but the score is is definitely vital to how it how it moves uh howard shore you know that's really all he's got you know he's got wins for for lord of the rings and then he's got a nomination for hugo but the guy the guy's a fucking rock star right and someone who's been around and is a recognizable name um some of my other favorite bits uh, are at the beginning of Return of the King, A Storm is Coming. Uh, that's kind of like the whiny, like, you know, that, that just like, ah, oh, you just know exactly where you're at. The title comes on, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. You know the story is going to end here. And um, just just breathtaking stuff. So I like uh, The Steward of Gondor is, is a cool one, right? Um, I, I, I think it's one of those no skip type albums. Like if you have, if you play the whole record through, there's never a point where you're like, ah, this part of the score is boring. And I think fellowship has a couple of those just due to the type of storytelling that that's happening. Uh, but return of the King has none of that. And that's why it's gotta be my top five. Uh, yeah. Return of the King is in my top five. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I thought I, I was, <laughs> I thought you were going to pick fellowship. So I went with return of the King. But for the same reasons, like it's it's the urgency and it's kind of a it's a it's a hybrid buildup of everything that Fellowship and Two Towers has offered us musically. It all comes into fruition in this epic journey's end. And uh, I'll save my favorite bits for when we get to it on my top five. It is it is further down. <laughs> but yeah, um, I, I, I figured. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. You know me. Fellowship is my favorite film of the three but return of the king's score is superior <laughs> yeah yeah it's a it's a masterpiece oh beautiful number five is lord of the rings for you i wow i wonder what's to come <laughs> <laughs> uh my number four is a film that keeps coming up on this show because it's a favorite and we are going to do it at some point 
And it's one of the few horror films to grace the Oscars. 1976, The Omen by Jerry Gold. Are you, are you kidding me? That's my number four, too. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. It's awesome. It's scary as shit. And I just, to this day, I'm, I love that the Oscars acknowledged that. They said, like, this horror film has the best score of 1976. Goldsmith got his Oscar. And, yeah, the music makes that film so much creepier than it could be without it. And, yeah, I'll, I'll go to bat for that film forever and for that score and for that Oscar. Uh, Horror is so often underrepresented. So when we do get the win, I like to really hammer that home. So Goldsmith gets it for, for the omen number four. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, this, I mean, 1976, this is when Rocky comes out, right? So (laughs) this is this film, this film score beats the Rocky score, which has become this never ending, you know, iconic, beautiful, beautiful score, but come on the omen in my opinion, it has just more to offer. Um, and, and, and Jerry Goldsmith in the seventies is just on a different fucking playing field than, than everybody else. Uh, in particular, uh, I love what he does with Patton, uh, the omen and, uh, Chinatown. Those are my, those are my, those are the three from the seventies that I really, really dig. Uh, God damn the omen. The omen has a few, few tracks that are just so scary and, and, and probably, I'll go, I'll go ahead and say this. I think has along with John Carpenter's work, like in Halloween, like is in the running for the best horror score, like of all time, the omen, uh, and just does exactly what it's supposed to do. You know, uh, when you, when you want, when you want music to, to match what's happening, that's cool. That's fine. But when you want it to almost counteract what's happening and, make it even more unsettling is, is so, so powerful. And with the omen, there's a lot of times where, um, the power is when is in what we don't see. And that, that lies within the music and the feeling you get, the emotions you get from the music from Jerry Goldsmith. So it, it was one of the very first films I thought about when I was thinking about, okay, we're doing winners. I know the omen from the seventies is just like, just like a fucking shoe. And it, it, it and, and honestly, if Rocky would have won, probably would have put that in my top five too because they're both just they're completely different you know uh conti's work in that is just is so so good and uh, you can't go wrong 1976 is one of the best oscar years and i love that the omen is kind of uh like a winner from that from that year that's 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 really special i we're gonna do that film one day you know we've done rocky we've done taxi driver from 1976 the omen is definitely next in line i can't wait yeah to me, it's all about, you know, music in a horror movie, especially, is crucial because it enhances that, you know, that tingling in the back of your neck. Like that's you need that music to work. And for me, the scene that clinches it is I, I, t- I talked about this when we did it on Filmgasm. The scene where Gregory Peck's wife realizes that Mrs. Baylock is not all she appears to be. And mm. the music soars into this crazy Gregorian chant of evil. And then Mrs. Thorne flies out the fucking window. <laughs> Incredible. Oh my God. Yeah. I can talk about the omen forever. I adore that movie. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's like a perfect film. It's a 10 out of 10 type, type, type movie. And uh, yeah, Jared Goldsmith is the man. He's got so many Oscar nominations, you know, from, from the omen to Chinatown to Poltergeist to Hoosiers to Basic Instinct to Mulan. You know, he, he's just a super, superstar. And his only win is for the Almond. So I, I just think that's, it's so unique for the Oscars to do that. And when that happens, you know, I, I think we both get get super jazzed. So yeah, I figured it'd be on, I don't know. I, I figured it'd be on yours, but I was like, no way do we have it right <laughs> both at number four. That's perfect. So we can go ahead and hear number three. Well, you know how much I love the 90s Disney run. You, you, I mean, I've talked about that many times, and this is the only Oscar that this man has, and I can't fucking believe that. Hans Zimmer's score for The Lion King. Oh, man. The Lion King score, I can't make it a second into that movie without tears coming out of my eyes. There's something about that uh, 
circle of life, you know, I'm sure Hans had some input on that. And then just the king of pride rock. I mean, my God, Simba at the end of the Lion King, taking his place in the circle of life, you know, fulfilling his father's wishes and being king. The music that plays during that is some of the most triumphant, glorious music ever put to film. And, you know, curse anybody who tears these films down because they're for kids or whatever. These are beautiful works of art that are should be treasured forever. And, you know, Hans taking home best score for that is just, you know, cementing that. Uh, and still, I mean, the amount of work this guy's put into film and this is it for him, I, I still can't believe that. But, uh, you know, maybe, maybe he'll get another one with Dune. But The Lion King is amazing yeah 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 god Hans Zimmer is arguably you know I think behind John Williams for just being the most revolutionary film film composer probably of all time uh uh god and Hans uh so when we when we decided to do this project I was like all right Wizard of Oz music Let's talk about we've never really done a like a score or a soundtrack or a song a top five on, on any of our shows. So I think it's kind of cool to marry mine and your favorite things, which is, you know, music and movies. And they just they just go hand in hand. Uh, literally that day when I sent you the text, I was like, hey, man, I want to I want to do scores. And you're like, yeah, fuck, yeah, I'm down. Uh, the podcast that I listen to most, The Big Picture, hosted by Sean Finnessy and Amanda Dobbins, they released an episode that was just straight up top five scores. And it's it's completely insane because there's these two geniuses talking about, you know, they're both film fanatics that are, you know, in their late 30s that have just seen so much and are talking about movies. And, um, you know, it's, I, I've seen all the films that they shouted out and I was just like, this is so cool hearing these people talk about these scores. I can't wait to do it myself with a you know more confined pool but then at the end of the episode the last 30 minutes is an interview with Hans Zimmer oh and that's just like you know that's just the power of the big picture and Sean Fennessy is one of the you know one of the the great podcasters of today and he's just got a lot of pull in the film community and Hans Zimmer I mean I don't know how you could like him more but it made me like him more just hearing him talk about his his craft and talk about how at the beginning of at the beginning of his interview, he's like, I don't really think people care what I have to say because they just listen to my music, but let's see if they do. And Sean is like, I think people do, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're Han, you're Hans fucking Zimmer. You know, you're, you're this guy who created it, your own instrument for Dune. Like he, you made up your own instrument and he's going to win that Oscar. If he doesn't, I, I don't know what's going on. You know, I love Johnny Greenwood to death and I love his score for power of the dog, but Hans Zimmer is literally taking the craft to to wholly new places for Dune, and it's the best part of Dune is the music. Yeah. And so I would love I would love to see him rewarded for that. Um, he's the fucking man. I do not have him on my list, so I'm really glad we get to kind of talk about him because he's he's an all time. You know, and I I knew Lion King was going to be on your list because I know I know how important that movie is to you. Uh, great great pick and. It's just weird that the Lion King wasn't out for Best Picture. That's always my kind of like why. Like, I'm not a huge, huge fan of it, but it is it is this classic movie that certainly should take a couple spots from that '94. You know, I'm not saying it should take a spot from Pulp Fiction or Shawshank, but the other films I think it rivals and is is maybe better than. So I, I always wonder. You know, Lion King has all this praise. Beauty and the Beast was up for Best Picture. Why not Lion King? You know, it's it's probably the more important film. Yeah, you know, I mean, I probably not going to stand up against Shawshank and Pulp Fiction. I mean, some people I get, there's an argument for Gump even, but four weddings and a funeral. It's, it's better yeah. than that. And quiz show. I love quiz show to death, but like, are people really talking about quiz show? Like they are Lion King. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the great mysteries of life. Why the Lion King did not get more attention at the, at the Oscars. Yeah. Yeah. But but like you said, Hans Zimmer got that got got that shit. And didn't it win best best song too for Can You Feel the Love Tonight? Uh yeah, it was funny. Elton John had dominated that category. It's like it was also up for Circle of Life and Akuna Matata. It was like that's right. No way Elton John wasn't winning that night. Yeah. If he yeah, if he did, that would have been a damn shame. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, good shout. Uh cool to talk about Zimmer. What what 
what would be your, is that your favorite Zimmer or is that just your favorite winning, you know, cause he, you know, it's his only win. Um, do you have a, do you have a favorite Hans Zimmer? My favorite Hans Zimmer. Um, let me do a quick check here just to see what I've got. Cause I have a lot running around my head. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I really like his score uh, for the Da Vinci code. That's a favorite mm. of mine. Uh, Man of steel actually, I think is a, not a great movie, but the music is impeccable. Uh, and then of course, everything he did for the dark Knight trilogy and the pirates franchise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's one of those go-to guys for big picture, like big budget, like crazy movie. And I, I love what he does. Uh, yeah. I'm, I really hope he takes it for Dune as well. I agree with you that Dune, like the best thing about that movie was the music. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I like Dune, but the music I love, uh, Hans Zimmer, my favorite thing he's done is parts of the Caribbean dead man's chest, uh, mm -hmm. in particular, Davy Jones from, ah from that track list. Uh, I love that one. Uh, but he, yeah, he's got, he's got countless things. We could do a whole episode just on him. Uh, he's the man he's been brought up before and he'll get brought up again and again and again on Oscar Sunday. Cause he's, he's a master. My favorite dead man's chess score. I love Davy Jones. I think without his music, I don't think you realize just how tragic a villain Davy Jones is. Uh, mm. but my favorite track off dead man's chest is the Kraken. Oh yeah, the Kraken's intense as fuck. Yeah. Oh goddamn, what an epic scene! <laughs> I love those movies. Those first two are so fucking badass. The third oh. one's pretty good, but those first two are like perfect. I I throw the third one in there for me. All three are an epic trilogy. I love the third one just because of the you know the finality of it. Finally getting to see the, these stories pan out, and I thought they did a good job finishing it off. Personally, I mean, I know some people have a beef with it being almost three hours long, but I, I don't mind. That's a comfort food movie to me. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't mind three hours at all. You know, but one of my favorite movies I've seen in the past year is the Batman. That was three hours. So yeah, <laughs> I, just, I just, I just do not care about runtime uh, unless the movie's, you know, just like boring, which parts of the Caribbean is not. Uh, that's a good, all right, cool. Huh? Hans Zimmer got his shroud out. That's good. Uh, my, my next one is, uh, is one that I'm sure you predicted would, would, would show up at some point. It's uh it's Brockwack mountain. It's a, uh, Gustavo Santalala, uh, amazing, amazing score. Gustavo uh, won. He's been nominated twice and won twice for Brockback Mountain 2005 and Babel 2006. Uh, good God. Uh, there's, 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 you know, uh, different kinds of ways to make a, make a, make a score super impactful, you know, and I think Lord of the Rings, you know, Return of the King is this just powerful, powerful, you, you know, orchestra type just like boom in your face uh stuff from howard shore and the omen is this kind of mix of everything i love and is just uber creepy from goldsmith but uh gustavo's score for brokeback is this subtle country kind of kind of old school type score that that uses a lot of tropes from from movies of, of our past and i i adore it so much um in particular the there's brokeback mountain one Brokeback Mountain 2 and Brokeback Mountain 3. Those are the three names of my favorite tracks on, on the score. And they're just these, they kind of, they kind of intensify as the movie goes along, as our story unfolds between, of course, you know, J Jake Gyllenhaal and Heath Ledger, the, the gay cowboys. And I fucking love this movie, man. Um, and that initial, you know, directed by Ang Lee, and you can just kind of hear the guitar. Bang! you're just kind of you're, you're kind of at home you understand you're in the hands of a, of a fucking genius and you're about to watch uh, in my opinion one of the masterpieces of the 21st century uh and i'm so glad i'm so glad it kind of you know it got the most nominations at that ceremony and won the most awards at that ceremony it didn't win best picture of course losing the crash but it did really well and people remember it really well you know it's a film that has stood the test of time now, 17 years old, and uh, has not has not lost lost a beat at all. And you, you, you know you know how I feel about this one. You know I think Heath Ledger should have won. I think Jake Gyllenhaal should have an argument to win. Uh, you know, and I, I'm saying I, I'm saying that as a huge Philip Seymour Hoffman fan, I really do think Heath Ledger is better in this movie than Philip Seymour Hoffman is in Capote. So that's like hard for me to say, but. Uh, a lot of people look at you know the Dark Knight for Heat's best stuff. I think Brokeback is his best stuff. And um, speaking speaking about Gustavo, I, I think he 
just coexist with these actors, with these characters so well, and is, is the most subtle uh, score on my list for sure. I wanted to have one kind of like a little bit more easygoing kind of thought provoking type score to go to go on my, on my list. So it's, it's broke back. I'm very glad you picked this because it, it barely uh, didn't make my list. I had, I was kind of this in high noon where I was back and forth with it. But I, I thought like oh, he'll probably have broke back, so I, I picked high. Yeah. Uh, any chance I get to have broke back on a top five? I'm choosing it. Choosing I get it. Shit. It's a magnificent film, and the score is so beautiful, so representative, representative of, you know, being you know lovelorn and in a situation where love is not an option, but also enduring. Like Gustavo understood that very well, mm-hmm. and it's very clear throughout the film. I love that he got back to back wins too. Just broke back and then babble. Just goddamn, what an artist! Uh, and really, just mostly with an acoustic guitar. Like, there's not a lot of not a lot to that score. It's just simplicity. And sometimes, you know, you need that. Um, yeah, good, good shout out. Yeah, and and one thing I I learned about this movie recently, I was reading about broke back and and because I, I I really want to read the short story. I think it's I think her name is Annie Prue. I believe. Yeah. Uh, she she wrote this short story, Brokeback Mountain, and said that this is really cool. She said that the influence, the inspiration she got to write this was from reading The Power of the Dog, which came out, I believe, in the 60s. Uh, and of course, Power of the Dog now, uh, directed by J- Jane Campion, is a film that is got 12 motherfucking nominations and is definitely at the forefront to win Best Picture. And it's cool that Brokeback came out 17 years ago, but it's this, it's this story that was influenced by the power of the dog from, you know, 30 some odd years uh, earlier than 1997 when the short story comes out. I just think that's so fucking cool how art just keeps kind of inspiring itself and coming back around. And if you're, if if you're open to it, then it's like, wow, it's pretty, pretty powerful how these people are just, just, they just fucking bounce off one another. (laughs) That is neat. Uh, explains you know all the kind of similar tones of, of power of the dog or at least what i've seen of it i still have to finish that movie oh um, dude yeah i love power of the dog <laughs> i'm gonna yeah considering it is probably going to win I'm, I'm gonna have to watch that soon uh i'll start over i'm not gonna just go back in blind after like four months <laughs> yeah it's 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 a it's a slow motherfucking burner that's for sure um but it's just, it's got an aesthetic to it that is just gorgeous. And, you know, Johnny Greenwood, you got such an interesting cast of these people that, uh, that come, them coming together is just an odd bunch that just works for me. And yeah, I really like it. But I, I love that fact that broke back the stories inspired, you know, is influenced by the story of Part of the Dog from the 60s. And now Part of the Dog comes out 17 years after the film. So it's just cool. It's cool. It is cool. That is a nice. Uh, cyclical aspect to this story. That's cool. Um, my number two, I believe. Yes, is Crazy. is Return of the King. Okay. Uh, okay. I think it would have been really cool if in 2002 Howard Shore got the win for Two Towers, and it would have just been this triple sweep. That would have been so cool. Uh, but you know, doesn't always work like that. Oh, what what won that year? Chicago or or what won in 2002? Original look, score O two. I I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look that up. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, but yeah, Return of the King represents the you know the journey's end, the culmination of this epic adventure, this journey towards good versus evil, and it just you know, <laughs> Return of the King is so perfect. I mean, it's, it's it was a clean sweep at the Oscars. Fucking what eleven wins? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Unreal, man. And, you know, throughout this whole path, you've got Howard Shore laying, laying the bricks with his incredible music. Um, my personal favorite uh, that clinched it, this was the first one I wrote down. Uh, the Battle of the Pelinor, uh, Pelinor Fields. Mm. That, that is the score that I, that moment, I, probably my favorite moment in the entire franchise. It's when Theoden arrives at Minas Tirith to back up uh, Gondor and take on the this massive army of orcs with his very 
limited army of, you know, from Rohan. And they all kind of know they're going to die. They know this is it. Like, there's no way they're going to win, but at the very least, they can provide some hope. And just, you know, Theoden, like their death, their, their cry of death, and then charging the orcs. And then the Rohan theme starts up. Like, how do you not get stirred by that shit? It's yeah. so powerful. It's amazing. And then, you know, the Grey Havens, which is a nice kind of, oh, you know, slow burn song that just kind of feels like the whole fucking journey compressed into one tune almost. It's, it's magic. Uh, the Lord of the Rings is magic. And it's going to be one of my favorite experiences my entire life. Uh, yeah, enough said. Yeah, beautiful. Well, well, well put, man. Uh, the Two Towers wasn't even nominated for score. What is that? Uh, yeah, that's that's some garbage. Uh, 2002, uh, Road to Perdition was nominated. Thomas Newman mm. can't argue that. The Hours, yeah. Philip. The Hours, uh, Philip Glass. Uh, Far from Heaven, Elmer Bernstein. Elmer Bernstein's an absolute absolute legend. Uh, Catch Me If You Can, John Williams. Okay, <laughs> all right. And the winner, Frida by Elliot Goldenthal. So. Uh, yeah, that's 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 a tough beat. I remember I I remember when we did the fiftieth episode on all the Lord of the Rings movies, and Two Towers just got like fucking, I know pushed pushed to the side. It's like that might be the best I, one. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say I haven't seen Frida. I do want to, but Elliot Goldenthal. I just I always think of his lazy fucking Batman score from mm. Forever and Robin. Those are, those are the movies he's going to be remembered for, as far as I'm concerned. So every time I hear his name, I just think, nah. And that might not be fair. You know, every yeah. composer's done some shit movies, but he's done some really shit movies. It's going to be hard to hard to wipe that off, you know? Yeah, yeah that, that's so great. That that's, that's where your mind goes because uh, just, yeah, two, two films that are notoriously just terrible. Uh, <laughs> Ellie Goldenthal. Yeah, so yeah, maybe one day we'll do, uh, you know, I, I want to do... I mean, I really want to do Road to Perdition. I love Catch Me If You Can. It's just a fun, fun film. So, you know, you never know. We might, we might go through that that uh, that ceremony at some point and kind of cover those films. Um, so that's your number two. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're we're getting down to down to the heavy hitters here. Uh, my number two is a is a little tiny film called Jaws from 1975. Uh, <laughs> speaking of John Williams. Oh boy, what you know? What what do you, what do you, what do you want from the guy? Um, he's the goat. He's the goat. There's no there's no denying it. When you want IP mixed with some of the finest composing of all time, film composition, you get John Williams. If you want you want Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know you want Jaws, you know you you want Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you get John Williams. You know <laughs> you want Harry Potter, you get John Williams. Uh, he's he's just the man you know so many of the biggest films of all time are scored by him and 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 he's he's like still still doing it you know, like this guy just can't fucking stop and i i adore him and jaws is definitely my favorite thing he's ever done um you know what what, what do i need to say you know that the, the the iconic main title theme from jaws is just one of the most bone chilling things from any film and uh, I felt like I had to throw a couple just straight up fucking genre movies on here. The Omen and, the jo- and Jaws, 1975, 1976. These films just mean mean so much to filmgasm and mean so much to to you and I as movie fans. And uh, I, I, I just I think it's probably the best movie of all time. Jaws, best American movie ever. So uh, I, I'm not saying it's my favorite, but I just I I don't know if you can not enjoy that movie. Um, as a, as a human being. Uh, so a lot has to do with, with, with the, the pulsating score that we, that we get throughout. Um, I think my favorite, I, I mean, I love the theme, but I think my favorite bit is probably uh, later on in the film, it's called the underwater siege. Um, and that's, that's when we have, you know, our favorite characters going after the fucking shark and we, we see death, we see chaos, we see redemption, we see, everything you can fucking fit in a movie within, you know, 10 minutes. So it, it, it is beautiful. And I, I, I want to watch this movie right now. <laughs> well, we are clearly on the same wavelength because my number one is Jaws. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
what more can be said? This is an absolute classic, an undisputed masterpiece of American cinema and a haunting score that has probably caused more nightmares than any music in history. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I still hear that when I, if I go like swimming at night, that's what I hear <laughs> yeah. in a pool, in a goddamn pool, like a pool in a backyard. And I'm like, there might be a giant fucking shark in here. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, it's that, you know, the shark theme that's become so iconic. So associated with sharks to parry it a hundred times. But then there's also like the subtle score when Quint's telling his Indianapolis story. Oh my God. Yeah. That's just so vicious in its own simplicity where you just, you're realizing what drives this man, what's haunted this man his whole life, why he hates sharks so much, why he feels like he has to kill them. Like you get it. And the music just over, under, you know, overlays that and really like makes you sympathize for this whack job for the first time in the entire film. Uh, John Williams is the goat. He's the undisputed master of cinematic music. And I mean, he's coming back to do the, the Obi-Wan Kenobi show that Disney plus is doing. Yeah. Okay. I saw the trailer for that and I was like, dude, stop. Like you're too good at this. You've completely mastered this craft. Like, and I don't even fucking care about that show. I'm not a big, not a big star Wars fan, but I am a John Williams fan and I'll watch I'll watch Empire Strikes Back just so I can hear John Williams' fucking <laughs> relentlessly good score from the, from that movie. And it's just God, the guy, the guy understands the filmmaking and what it means uh, to be to be the definition of cinema. And pairing him with Steven Spielberg is like, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll, like what what more can you want from from somebody, right? Uh, they just they they both get it probably more than anybody in American, American history, uh, as far as these, these films that are coming out uh, in the seventies, eighties, you know, just cra- John Williams has such a crazy run in the seventies and eighties. That just is, is untouchable. Well, he's got like what 50 something nominees. I think he's the most decorated single person in Oscar history. Uh, <laughs> he's insane. And he's won four. And look at this, look at this variety. Jaws, Star Wars, E.T., and Fiddler on the Roof. I mean, Let's go. <laughs> come on. And yeah, I mean, the Star Wars score alone, when I watched the Kenobi trailer, which I'm very much looking forward to, when Duel of the Fates started up, I about lost my fucking mind. I was like, oh my God. And then just the music kept coming. He, he mixed together four iconic tracks from Star Wars for that trailer alone. What the fuck is he bringing to the table for the actual show? I mean, uh, John Williams, my God, keep them coming. and. Yeah, Jaws remains maybe my favorite of his scores. I mean, it's up there with Indiana Jones, but he didn't win for Raiders, which is baffling. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. And Chariots of Fire. Fucking yeah, <laughs> Chariots of Fire straight up robbed Raiders of the Lost Ark with the without a fucking gun at that ceremony. Like, ugh, disgusting. Yeah. Had a fucking starter starter's pistol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the like synthesizer thing or whatever, like, you know, in the 80s uh, is like is fun and all. But uh, I mean, come on, what are we doing? <laughs> but yeah, nothing else was was going to top this. Jaws is one of my all time favorite scores, my maybe my favorite John Williams score and the very definition of what music can add to a film. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. God, this guy, this guy's crazy. He also won for Schindler's List in the 90s. Uh, he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah, this guy. This guy's a. This guy's a fucking freak. Um, I, 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 I don't really understand him. You know, he does Nixon right after that. Sleepers, Amistad, Saving Private Ryan, Patriot, Harry Potter, AI, artificial intelligence. Catch me if you can. More Harry Potter, Munich. <laughs> like, More God, Harry, dude. <laughs> stop. Like, stop. You're you're fucking crazy. And 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 again, you know, I think. I think that Empire Strikes Back specifically, you know, he wins for Star Wars in uh, 1977 Star Wars, but 1980 Empire Strikes Back is where all the bangers are, you know, uh, that's where all the like iconic, you know, the uh, Imperial March isn't in the original Star Wars. It's in Empire Strikes Back. Those moments, if you're like unfamiliar with, with those movies like I am and you're like, oh, let's go back and watch Star Wars. And you're like, you watch the first one, you're like, kind of let down because you're like wait where's all the good you know fucking crazy music it's like oh it's in this it's in- 
console. You know, you have to, you have to keep going to, you have to keep going to get to that cool Darth Vader shit. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, this guy, this guy's the best, but I, I, I'll definitely stand by Jaws being my, my personal favorite uh, of, of all of his work. And it also happens to be, happens to be a winner. Uh, the year before that, he does Towering Inferno, 1974, a film that we both watched the first time because of this, this podcast, because of this show. And that's range right there. You know, he's just doing completely different kinds of films. Yet he does Superman in 1978. Like, come on. Like, I don't know. We could go on and on. John Williams is, is, is a God. And I can't believe he's still like, still has it still has the touch. He could have retired decades ago, but he keeps coming back with just amazing. I mean, he's the best thing about the Disney star Wars movies. They're kind of shit, but he brought his a game. Cause I don't think he knows how to phone it in. I really don't think he does. No, no, he's, he's, he's 90 years old. He just turned 90 and back in February. Um, what, like, uh, like that's, ins- that's insanity. You know, uh, this guy's career has run over like seven decades and he just is not showing any signs of letting up. Uh, so I, I think giving him his flowers while he's here and while he's working is so, so necessary, you know, um, because when we do inevitably lose him, it's going to be a sad day for, for, for cinema. Yeah. But, you know, the man's legacy is, I mean, it t- it's taken on a life of its own. He, John Williams, you don't think of a man when you hear that name. You think of an incredible wealth of movie music that stretches across half a fucking century. And you just, you have that going in your head. You got Jurassic Park and Indiana Jones and Superman fighting each other for supremacy in your head <laughs> exactly yeah you, you understand you understand what you understand the task at hand my friend i, I figured you know I, I didn't think we'd have this much overlap but then when you think about it it's like come on you know lord of the rings the omen <laughs> this is what we do you know these are the movies that we love that we've, we've grown to love over over years of our lives so uh very cool do you have any guesses as to what my number one is mm, in terms of winner it's um, I'll give you a, I'll give you a hint. It's from the past. I'll say from the past 15 years. Mm, um, oh, I, I don't, I don't know. You're going to know I'll, when I'll know it immediately. As soon as you say it, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, 2010, yeah. the social, the social network. <laughs> oh man. I, I listened to this more than any any score ever that's why i i uh because it won i was like i i I knew immediately this is gonna be my number one i listen to this all the time it's my favorite thing to listen to when i'm writing um it's my favorite thing to listen to when i'm driving (laughs) i like listening to it when i'm getting ready for work it's this weird just kind of tone setter type type score that works on its own just as well as it does in the movie and uh the beginning of the score starts with uh, hand covers bruise, uh, in motion, and a film a familiar taste. Those are probably my three favorite, like like compositions like ever, and and that's crazy for them to be the first three tracks on 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 a singular score from a singular movie by the guy from fucking Nine Inch Nails. Like, who would have thought this rock star turned composer would would take over in the way that he has? You know, uh, his work with David Fincher. Um, his work on, you know, he's done the work on TV shows, his work on mid nineties with Jonah Hill is like, wait, what? Like how, he, we don't deserve him. Uh, his work on soul that just won, uh, won last year for best original score. Uh, he, he's just insane. And Atticus Ross his his partner in, in writing, writing, a music is, is equally just as, you know, just has just as much genius. Uh, but it's, it's this social network score that, that just stands out the most for, from, from his stuff uh, and was the one that was like, Hey, I'm here, I'm here to stay, you know, and I'm not just some guy who was the singer of this band. Like I, I love movies and I'm going to be around for God knows how long, you know, I think, I think him and Johnny Greenwood uh, are in kind of the same new contemporary f- film score genre where they're literally, you know, it's a guy from Radiohead, a guy from Nine Inch Nails who are like, I think I want to try this. And immediately when they try it, they master it. You know, uh, Johnny Greenwood starts out with There Will Be Blood. 
Trent Reznor starts out with social network. It's like, what are you kidding me? You know, I, can you get any stronger than that? And they're, they're, they're still here. They're still doing it. They're still some of the best in the game right now. And uh, the, the track I lean towards most, it's tough. You know, in motion is the track when uh, Jesse Eisenberg, Mark Zuckerberg starts. Um, he pulls up his computer at the beginning of the film and he starts fucking, he starts drinking beers and he's like, I'm going to fucking blog. I'm going to fucking be a little bitch boy. And, and, and I'm going to make, make this girl really upset that just basically broke up with me. Um, and that, that track is, is so like pounding on the, on the, on the soul. So cool. A familiar taste is when we're seeing some of the dark sides of Harvard, we're seeing some of the dark shit that goes on at Harvard and we're seeing him go deeper into the blogging and deeper into this weird scheme that he has to get back at his again, ex-girlfriend. But it's that first track hand covers bruise that plays. That's just this, this haunting piano as Zuckerberg is running from the bar, the pub that he was at when he got broken up with and going back to his dorm and he's plotting and he's thinking, and he's got the weird flip flops on and the hoodie and uh, Jesse Eisenberg is just kind of jogging the Harvard campus, which is just a gorgeous piece of filmmaking from Fincher. But, uh, but that score makes it what it is, you know, and I think it's easily the strongest piece of the movie a movie, in my opinion, that has has something to say about being one of the best movies of the century. And uh, as time goes on, the movie gets better and better because Facebook gets weirder and weirder and weirder. So I, 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 I adore that film. I adore the score. It immediately I knew it's 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 my number one. There's just no question about it. It's the one I'm closest to. I should have known. I always forget about that one. Uh Honestly, it is, you know, if you're if you were to pitch that film to somebody who'd never seen it, and you're like, it's the it's a movie about the creation of Facebook, you'd be like, get the fuck out of here. I don't want to watch that. Yeah. But you tell yeah. them David Fincher directed it and it has this incredible score. Then I'd be like, you know what? All right. And I, you know, that's kind of how it was pitched to me. I was like, when I heard about it, I'm like, why would I want to watch that? And then I watched it and I'm like, this is fucking awesome. And yeah, the music is a big part of that. It really lends itself to this kind of weird menacing tone that I feel like you should be paying more attention to. Like it's, it's cool to see somebody become a bad guy. You don't really yeah. see that in a lot of films, but this is how Mark Zuckerberg turned to the dark side. And mm. the music is, you know, the shadow that's looming over him the whole time. It's, it's awesome. Uh, definitely, if you haven't seen this, I, I know it sounds shit on paper, but w- watch this movie. It's really good. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I saw, you know, 2010, uh, you know, uh, we were teenagers, of course, and uh, my, my old, oldest brother was like, no, like, trust me, like, this is the guy who made Fight Club. You know, this is the guy who did Seven, you know, uh, this is the guy who did Zodiac, like, just trust that instinct, that instinct to go and watch a filmmaker just do, do his shit. And it's the most, in my opinion, I mean, Zodiac's my favorite of his films, but Social Network's like the most impressive because of that. Like he takes this story about these fucking annoying ass people at Harvard who are all just like pretentious douchebags and makes it so entertaining and endlessly rewatchable because it's like only two hours which is hard for finch to... uh he's usually a guy who's pushing two and a half three hours uh I, I i yeah i think i think social network's like a damn near perfect movie and um it's one of those that that inevitably will come up on oscar sunday uh, for its own episode it's just a matter of time and i'm in no rush because i've seen this movie countless times this is one of those movies that before I met you and before, uh, before I met you, Connor, and before uh, we started, you know, podcasting together and ch- challenging ourselves to watch more and more and more and more and more and watch new stuff, watch stuff you haven't seen, watch old movies. Um, this was the film that I would go back to over and over because it was this kind of cerebral experience where I felt like I was learning about filmmaking watching these masters just all uh, I hit on all cylinders and uh, I still feel that way when I watch it it's just crazy how impactful it is on my life and um, you know it, it's it's a movie that's like really really important to mine and 
my oldest brother Adam and his his wife Caitlin are like our relationship. We all fucking love this movie and we quote it. We talk about it all the time. Anytime people talk about the best movies of the 2010s, we're like, we're all like, we're going to bat for fucking social network, you know? And I love that. I love that it kind of like brings us together. It's something that my brother and I have always bonded over. And that's like deeply important to me when watching movies is uh, sharing them with someone else is like so, so cool. It's such a cool experience. Yeah. It's the whole reason we do this is so we can tell each other, like, check out this movie. And yeah, with the social network, like, yeah, you definitely were learning. Like this was a film that you recognized that film could be more than I think you thought at the time. Yeah. I've often, yeah. I've often said that, you know, film, like being a film buff is constantly working on a jigsaw puzzle and some pieces are going to be bigger than others. You know, some, some puzzle pieces are going to help you realize the big picture. Social network was one of those films for you. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's part of the fun. You know, you don't know what the picture is going to look like when you're done. You might never even finish the puzzle, but you're making this incredible effort. And the journey is all about like just to, in, you know, enjoying it. Yeah. Uh, Straight up. Well said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I should have known that was going to be your number one. <laughs> uh, this was fun as hell, man. So my, my five, we have three of the same films. <laughs> That's great. My number five is return of the King. Number four, the omen. Number three, Brokeback mountain. Number two, jaws. Number one, social network. And my five, uh, number five, High Noon. Number four, The Omen. Number three, The Lion King. Number two, Return of the King. And number one, Jaws. God, that's crazy. Out of all of those movies. Um, you know which one I had the hardest time cutting? <laughs> the Red Shoes from 1948. Really? Yeah. That one, wow. that, one in high, that one in High Noon, I was like, man, I love these movies. And The Red Shoes has such a like fucking scary a way ahead of its time type score, you know, this orchestra, this massive, these massive pieces that are just kind of get under your skin. And I, I think it's due to me seeing these five films way more than that one. You know, these are films that I've watched over and over uh, while the red shoes is a film I've seen twice. Uh, I, all that jazz, 1979. Um, I love, 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 love that movie. I love the music in that movie. But um, again, it's a movie I, I'm not as familiar with. And so I, I kind of just went with my heart here. You know, these are movies that have been with me for a while. And uh, yeah, I think this will work as a good segue. I actually had a tough time uh, cutting the wizard of Oz. I, I, I wondered, I wondered. Yeah, I love this movie. The music is amazing. And it was tough for me to not put this, but I had to go with my gut. I think I've, evol- I've, I've personally evolved as a film buff to recognize, you know, other, other films that are as significant. And I really wanted to shout out high noon. And everything else was just like too set in stone for me. It was, I mean, these are movies that are just like a part of my fucking DNA. <laughs> it's, mm. it's hard to argue with that. Yeah. Yeah. It really is hard. It's, it's tough, tough, tough to beat that. Uh, so yeah, this, this is, this is awesome. It's one of my favorite top fives we've done just having three of the same films and then both being able to talk about two films that we, we both are just super jazzed about. Uh, it's really cool. And music, uh, you know, yeah, you know, I love movies to death, but music is by far and away the most important art medium of all time. Uh, it, it's it's something that you literally can take with you anywhere. And movies are a thing where you really have to sit down and appreciate. You really have to like take time. And that's why I love them so much. It takes this kind of patience to really recognize something good. But music, yeah. you can listen. You can listen to music while you're walking from point A to point B. You can listen to it in your car. You know, you, you do different things. You can be showering and listening to music. So uh, it's just, it, it's so important to like open your ears to stuff. And uh, I love that we got to kind of marry those two things. You know, movies and music is, you know, it's, it's like the greatest relationship of all time. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And I do love using this podcast as a way to showcase the symbiotic relationship between movies and various different parts of the process. like you know highlighting score love to do one that highlights visual effects or mm. you know production design or film editing like this is a good medium to 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 showcase the various parts of film, uh, filmmaking that you you really need yeah i i totally agree i think 
anytime we do one of these top fives, it kind of opens another door. Um, I think that like the, those doors are production design, like you mentioned, or art direction or yeah, visual, visual effects. I think, uh, you know, we've done, we've done stuff on foreign films. We've done documentaries. We've done, you know, of course, best picture showdowns and talked about best act, you know, the, the performance categories we've talked about screenplay. It's fun to just kind of take a category and run with it. So, uh, Speaking of categories, the 12th Academy Awards, uh, Wizard of Oz, is nominated for uh, Best Special Effects, Best Art Direction, Best Picture, and then it won for Best Original Score and Best Original Song. So I think maybe we'll start with Special Effects. What do you think? Sounds good to me. All right, let's see. You know, there's there's so much change in categories uh, throughout the years. It's just kind of funny to look at. 12th the 12th academy awards and we're about to hit the 94th uh next next sunday a week from now fucking crazy uh the nominees are for best special effects gone with the wind only angels have wings the private lives of elizabeth and essex essex uh topper takes a trip what a great title uh union pacific uh the wizard of oz and the winner the reigns so, I mean, it's hard to believe that Wizard of, Oz, Wizard of Oz lost this. I mean, this was unlike anything anybody else, anybody ever seen in 1939. The, the rains came must be some visual spectacle <laughs> to beat this movie. It really doesn't make sense. Uh, I mean, The Wizard of Oz, you know, no other film had ever hybridized like that with black and white and color. Like the visuals of this film are still remarkable today. I have no idea what happened here. Yeah, me neither. I'm kind of reading about um, the rains came and I'm not really, I mean, the plot synopsis is so short. Um, I'm not really sure what it is that makes it so spectacular on that front. Uh, I guess we'll have to check it out someday. Yeah, for sure. Just, ah, okay. It says it right here. Uh, it, it won in the category of special effects and sound effects for the earthquake and flood sequences. Ah, there you go. I, I see that it was a movie based in India. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, there you go. The fictional town of Ranshapur is devastated by an earthquake, which causes a flood. Okay, there you go. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested. This is a, a scored by Alfred Newman. It's a, on a budget of $2.5 million. Okay, I'm interested. Yeah, why not? Definitely. 30s i'm not as well versed as i'd like to be but you know constantly learning yeah yeah and, and topper takes a trip is just a it just sounds like fun <laughs> <laughs> it's a sequel to 1937's topper <laughs> just 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 tap <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great yeah i love it of course gone with the wind is the monstrous film from this from this ceremony so it it loses this one but it's it's obviously the best picture winner and uh, won a shitload of other awards and is a movie that obviously we'll do a best picture showdown one day and tackle that monstrosity uh it has the interesting connection of uh victor fleming director most most important director of wizard of oz also a guy who went and saved apparently saved gone with the wind uh from directorial from a directorial standpoint so it's like he did these two movies like are you kidding me 1939 like is there anything more important than that i'm picturing one of those like you know Saul Goodman style lawyer commercials, but like Victor Fleming being like, if you've got a trouble production and you need a director to handle it, call Vic. <laughs> Cause apparently he was the miracle worker in 1939, saving these two troubled productions and turning them both into American classics. That that's amazing. Yeah. It, it, insane. Like totally insane. And Victor Fleming, uh, one best director for gone with the wind. Uh, he went against, this is a crazy group. He went against Sam Wood for Goodbye, Mr. Chips, Frank Capra for Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, John Ford for Stagecoach, and William Wyler for Wuthering Heights. Just are you, you can't get any bigger than that, uh, than, than those names. Those are some of the most iconic film directors of all time. So uh, definitely, definitely want to do Gone with the Wind at some point so we can kind of have these kinds of discussions and, and watch all these films. It does feel wrong that as a film buff, I have not seen Gone with the Wind. It doesn't feel right. I, I've seen it and I own it, but, um, you know, I feel like I should save my thoughts when we actually do it. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? I'm intimidated by a nearly five hour racist <laughs> civil war epic. So yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, if you in- include the you know overture and the intermission, uh, it's uh, 240 minutes. So um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who has that much free time in a row? Oh no, there's no way, you know, nowadays, if something's that long, it'll come out in like a three part segment on Netflix, you know, there's like three episodes that are all an hour and a half. Back Um, then, in 1939, you went to the movies, and you just were there for half the fucking day. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, straight up. Uh, So great. Uh, (laughs) The next, next category is best art direction. There's a shitload of nominees for for this category. We see that a lot with the old um, the older ceremonies where they just threw in as many movies as possible. Um, the nominees are for best art direction: Bo Jest, Captain Fury, First Love, Love Affair, Man of Conquest, Mister Smith Goes to Washington, The Private Lives of Elizabeth and Essex, The Rains Came. There it is again. Stagecoach, The Wizard of Oz, and Wuthering Heights. Uh, and the winner is Gone with the Wind. So there's just, that's what, 10 movies? Uh, <laughs> Christ. It was so arbitrary. I mean, look at that. 10 nominations for art direction, sound recording, cinematography gets two. Like, and then special effects has seven. Like, they were just making this shit up. Like, nobody cared about structure. It was just like, what are your favorite movies? All right, throw them in. Yeah. Sounds good, Bob. Yeah. Would you like, like this trusted. year? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, can you imagine? Oh, God. Um, Dude, if we still did it like this, I would probably not even bother with this podcast. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. If it was like that for 2020. Yeah. Like, like just nonstop for tw- like for all 94 Oscars, just an arbitrary shoving every movie in every year. Like, what's the fucking point? Yeah, no thanks. I definitely we've always talked about how we prefer five, five in every category to give it uh exclusivity and uh, that special feeling when you actually make the cut. Um that's yeah. that's the most important thing. Like like this, this group, I part of me doesn't want to do um uh a best picture showdown because l- listen to this, you know, Wizard of Oz is nominated for Best Picture along with Wuthering Heights, Stagecoach of Mice and Men, uh Nino Ninochka. Uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Love affair. Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Dark victory, and the winner gone with the win. I like. I, I need some time to watch all those. <laughs> it's a heavy fucking group of group of films. So I feel like we need like a lot of leeway to make sure we can actually check those out and not just bunch them in to bunch them in for for the sake of being able to say, yeah, Wuthering Heights is good. I want to actually have something to say about each movie and let them breathe a little bit. The weird thing is, like, it doesn't happen a lot, but this year, all of these are pretty culturally significant. Like, yeah, oh yeah, I would actually like to sit down and, and watch all of these films. If we have Me like too. you know two or three months notice, we could pull that off. Yeah, no, I I think that's what we're gonna have to do with some of these older years, especially one that seems so important. Like, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Frank Capra is a movie that people are still fucking adore, and. Yeah. Uh, of Mice and Men, you know, Stagecoach by John Ford, uh, Wuthering Heights is a film people adore, William Wyler. I, I, I think it would be a great showdown. I think it'd be really cool to rank these movies, but we are going to need, yeah, we're going to need some time to, to really digest all of that. Yeah. Well, good, because yeah, I've seen, a, I've seen a few of these. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is awesome. It's a great movie. Yeah. Stagecoach is a bit overrated. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not crazy about that one either. Yeah. But still, Neat. Uh, definitely want to yeah, do But we, we, both, we both like to, especially with the older years, we like to, if we've seen them before, we like to rewatch them to like get another glimpse at it because sometimes a rewatch, a rewatch can change everything. Yeah. And so, yeah, w- yeah we're going to need, I think, at least two months advance to just kind of <laughs> slowly knock those out. Um, but yeah, Wizard of Oz uh, in that Best Picture group, rightfully so. Uh, I think in any of those, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s years, it's just it's one of those kind of standouts that's going to be there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, cool. I'm glad it, you know, it made it in there, but it really shined with its two wins in music. Uh, yeah. Straight up. It, yeah. It, it wins both of these. Uh, we'll do, let's see, best song. Um, 
you have Faithful Forever from Gulliver's Travels. I poured my heart into a song from Second Fiddle. Uh, and then Wishing from Love Affair and the winner Over the Rainbow. I mean, yeah, come on, from Wizard of Oz. So there's just there's just four nominees in this in this category. And Over the Rainbow is a is a song that I've I've heard like 50 different versions of. And yeah. that's just true power. Yeah, not bad for a film that near or for a song that nearly got cut from the movie. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine? I it wouldn't, I, I think it's it's crucial. I I wonder where like I don't think Judy Garland would have had as successful a singing career as she would have had without Over the Rainbow. That was like her signature tune. Yeah, or she wouldn't get casted in the movie she gets casted after, you know. You know, you like look at a Star is Born movie in St. Louis, these movies that she needs she needs that that uh, chance to shine like this. Be like, hey, this is probably my greatest attribute is that I can yeah. I can act, but I can I can fuck and I can sing with the best of them. So, um, yeah, Judy Garland is a is a has been a special person in our in our kind of hearts, uh, especially from Judgment at Nuremberg. Right? Um, she's just like un fucking real in that movie. Everyone is Montgomery Clift, Burt Lancaster. You know, everyone's amazing in that movie. So, um, she's she's someone we did an, an episode on way back on Filmgasm. We did a, a whole focus on her and watched it handful of her films and of course Wizard of Oz is the first one you kind of think of yeah she never really escaped the shadow of this movie as much as she tried to uh but you know in the end I think she she made her peace with it I, I hope I like to think she made her peace but I don't know I sure do hope so man um yeah crazy have you seen these other three movies or no I've never heard of those three movies well I've heard of Culver's Travels but yeah, I've never yeah. heard of those other movies Neither have I. The other two I haven't heard of. Uh, well, I've seen Love Affair now a few times just by looking at this ceremony, but yeah. Like, just funny. It's funny <laughs> seeing these movies next to Wizard of Oz, which is this just fucking timeless uh, piece of art. Um, best original score. Uh, there's about, what, 12 here? Fucking shit. Uh, Dark Victory. Max Steiner. Uh, Eternally Yours. Werner Janssen. Golden Boy. Victor Young. Uh, Gone with the Wind. Max Steiner again. Gulliver's Travels, Victor Young, again. <laughs> the Man in the Iron Mask, uh, Lou Gluskin and Lucien Mor- Morawek. Man of Conquest, Victor Young, again. <laughs> so crazy. Uh, Nurse Edith Cavale, Anthony Collins. Of Mice and Men, Aaron Copland, or Copeland, I'm not sure. Uh, Rains came, Alfred Newman, and Wuthering Heights, also Alfred Newman. So you got three people who are mentioned multiple times uh, in the same category. Just, just pick one, you know. <laughs> I know. Uh, and of course, of, of of course, uh, Wizard of Oz, uh, Herbert Stothart, uh, just wasn't going to lose this one ever. It's yeah. The, the the whimsy comes mostly from the music, the terror at the Wicked Witch. It's like it's so plain in my head, like the music of the Wizard of Oz. It's just so iconic and perfect to this movie, as we've seen in films from this era really hard for the score to stand out uh because a lot of this was just you know a conveyor belt it was you, know, you worked on 10 movies as a screenwriter as a composer you just did your work for the week and you went home like it wasn't really i don't want to say not special but it it wasn't as unique i guess the, the filmmaking experience mm. yeah well well said yeah i think i think that's that's spot on um wizard of oz is there Anything else it should have been nominated for, in your opinion? Just off, think, like, the top of your head? Um, well, I know Best Makeup didn't exist yet. Uh, but, I mean, production design, did it, it, it got nominated for that? No. That's, oh, no, wait, Art Direction. Yeah, it did. Never mind. Uh, yeah, essentially, yeah, he had the same category, basically, yeah. I think that uh, cinematography, for sure, considering what they had to go through to make this film, like, stitch together... And then I think some performance nominations. I think Margaret Hamilton should be up. Uh, Judy Garland absolutely should be up. Uh, and I think, I don't remember the names, but I, I Cowardly Lion, whoever played him, he should, he should be up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, he's fucking hilarious. Burt Lair, that guy. Yeah, he should be. He yeah. should have been up. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Burt Lair. Uh, Frank Morgan, which one does he play? He's the, he's the wizard. Okay. Oh, he's the, he's the actual yeah. Uh, Ray Bulger, 
Yep, he was a scarecrow. There you go. Okay, that answers my answers my question. Yeah, I I love the scarecrow. He's great. He's awesome. I, I, I just I just laughed my ass off at those bozos, you know. Uh, this time around, watching watching this movie, they're just so silly. <laughs> yeah, they're bozos. They're the fucking three stooges. It's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically. <laughs> oh yeah, this is a fun movie. Uh, what about you? Yeah. Anything you think it should have been up for? Um. Yeah, performance stuff for sure. Uh, I think, I think, I think the biggest rob. I think the biggest like what the fuck is cinematography, um, which brings up the topic of of Technicolor and what this movie offers from a from a visual standpoint. Um, I, I also don't understand like you have two movies in the categories. Can we just add one more? Like what what's gonna what's it gonna hurt? So I I don't I don't really get that. Um, also, they separated it in black and white and color back then. So where does this lie? Got to be color, right? Because most of the movies in color. Right? Yeah, but I feel like Louis B. Mayer would bitch about that. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, he'd be like, "Well, I can't be in both." Yeah, uh, that probably was, was was something he he fucking bitched about. That guy was a goddamn nightmare. Um, <laughs> one of the most absurd people to have, have ever walked the face of the earth. Um, and was a was an absolute disaster uh, with this movie in particular, Wizard of Oz, uh, just like drugging Judy Garland, uh, just a just a fucking freak. Uh, yeah. I, he he's this name that people still remember, you know, and talk about, but I don't think he gets shit on nearly enough. No, he was the original Harvey Weinstein. He absolutely deserves to be shit on. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. But he also yeah, gave us the fucking Oscar. God, that sucks. Yeah, no, he he is he is the see. Uh, doesn't it suck that this is the guy who made made this made this thing that could be so cool, right? It had somebody else had control of it. Um, this is this is the game we play, though. You know, we 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 appreciate the the wins for the old men and Jaws and you know fucking broke back and high noon, but the the road to getting there is just just not not good, not fun and. Hurt, hurt a lot of motherfucking people, that guy. So that that's that's something I'll never really get over. And you always need or when you talk about the Oscars to just always kind of have that uh, that balance of sure you can have fun with it, but remember that it's 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 a it's a silly man's game, is what it is. Yeah, it's all arbitrary. Like you know, we got twelve nominations for score, two for cinematography. Who who makes that shit up? I I don't know. Like. In the end, does it really matter? Like you, you take what you get from it. Yeah. Does it does it mean I'm not blown away by the visual ass of Wizard of Oz? Hell no. So, and that, that's um, yeah. Cinematography is just bonkers. And I think I'll talk more about that with my awards because my awards have a lot to do with just how like breathtaking the movie is. Um, that's definitely what I appreciated most this time around from watching it was just the spectacle you know of wizard of oz i also think it somehow tells this story inside of like almost an hour and a half and pretty seamlessly so i'm i'm a fan of that i love that it's a movie based on a book that was essentially just about like how we should abolish gold and adopt the silver standard like that's pretty much what the whole book's about it was like why are we using gold let's use silver that's the whole reason l frank Baum wrote the book and it turned into this, you know, it's it's crazy how things, how art works out in some ways. It's weird. I, I love it though, man. I love it. Uh, speaking of speaking of our, our awards and what we appreciate most about Wizard of Oz, I think I think it's time. I think it's time to time to shout this movie out properly. Uh, you know, we have the Quentin Tarantino Award for the best quote of the movie. We have the Ennio Morricone Award for the best music moment. Music's been the key topic today. Um, any more Kone. I mean, ah, plate one. And I, ah, I, I almost put that in my list just out of respect, you know, but I'm like, no, like that's not his best work. Yeah. <laughs> if, if once upon a time, the West, if once upon a time, the West would have won, it might be my number one. I, like, I'm not kidding. You know, I think harmonica, that track, put that up against anything and it, it, it it'll probably beat it. Um, God, and you know, you're the man. It took way too long for him to win and be recognized. Uh, the Philip Summer Hoffman Award we have for the best performance of the movie. Uh, and then we finally have the Roger Deakins Award for the best overall scene of the movie. So take it away, Connor, with your Quentin Tarantino Award. 
All right. Before I get started, I do have just one observation about the film that I noticed this time that I never noticed before, and it had me kind of like rolling randomly. I'm going to call it the Judy Garland Bonus Award. Okay. Um, I, li- I like that. Just an observation. Uh, when the wizard tells the, the, the quartet to go get them, get him the Wicked Witch's broom, and he'll, send, he'll help them out. And they're hunting for the witch in, in this woods. They all have various tools to help them hunt. And Scarecrow has a fucking gun. Yes, he does. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He has a fucking revolver. And I just wonder why that isn't addressed more. Like, where did he get a gun in Oz? <laughs> <laughs> so awesome, though. Like, Scarecrow is like a gangster out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> like, why doesn't he start plugging the flying monkeys? That's what I want to know. <laughs> like, why didn't he just start uh, taking those fuckers out? I guess I guess the whole brain thing. I don't know. I'm not oh, sure. Oh, there. Yeah, good point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Anyway, uh, I just I would I needed to. I couldn't go this podcast without mentioning that crazy ass observation. Uh, so so good. My my Tarantino. I have two lines. Um, the first one comes from Scarecrow when he first meets Dorothy, and he's talking about how you know he wants a brain, and she's like, "Well, why? I mean, you can talk, right?" And he goes. Well, some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? That's <laughs> so good. So love good. That. <laughs> ah, and then my other one is just, it's one of the most famous quotes in the film, but I always love it. It's at the end when they, uh, Toto pulls the rug out about, you know, from under the wizard, pulls the curtain, and you see uh, the guy, and he yells as Oz, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. <laughs> That's what I chose. I love that quote. <laughs> I love that quote. Oh my God. It's hilarious. That moment is so goddamn funny. Because <laughs> he keeps going and he keeps talking into like the microphone. He's like, pay no attention to that man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's such a great uh, old school comedic moment. You know, like they, they, it's it's so wholesome that moment, you know. It's so just it's just funny, and there's no there's no fucking fluff around it. It's just funny. I also love after that when Dorothy walks up to him, is like, "Who are you?" And he yells into the thing, "I am the great and powerful." And then he takes it down, Wizard of Oz. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he provides this all like weird comedy uh, at the end of the film that just just fits perfectly. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the first one I wrote down. Uh, <laughs> I think that I think that bit's hilarious. I do love uh, when Dorothy says, uh, "This is like a, a a film connection that I love," and it's probably my second favorite quote when she says, "Lions, tigers, and bears." Oh my! I think of The Wolf of Wall Street when Leonardo DiCaprio and Jonah Hill are smoking crack together, and he's like, "We're gonna run like lions, tigers, and bears." <laughs> Like that's clearly from Wizard of Oz. Like that's so awesome, because Wizard of Oz, you know, is this. In one place, it's like this great family movie, and in another place, it's like this acid dripped. Like, what the fuck is happening? Like, who made this shit? And that connection with the drugs and with Wall Street has always been really funny to me. Well, I've I've heard you know there are people who say that like the Wicked Witch traumatized them as children. Like that's one of the most one of the scariest movie characters of all time. I mean, back in 1939, you know, this green evil witch was nightmare inducing. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and Margaret Hamilton went fucking hard for that. Like you said, she caught fire. Yeah. She literally, you know, she got like third degree burns from that, from that incident and had to go to the hospital, had to sit out from shooting for, for three months. This movie took forever to make. And Dude, it's just it's just crazy that it is what it is. The worst part, I read that when Margaret Hamilton got burned, they had to get the paint off. They had to get the, the face paint off. So they used fucking acetone on her burns to get that off. What? God. I would have gone to my agent and said, get me out of this fucking movie. <laughs> I mean, at that Jeez. point, like, what else can you lose? Yeah. Pay me my salary and I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a... The makeup is copper based. It's just all the fire, copper, acetone. Like, no thanks. I'd rather, I'd rather do any drug than than fucking deal with that, you know, and, and take what comes with it. Yeah. She was more flammable than like the fucking plywood set. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God, no kidding. Yeah, this movie fucks with fire a lot. And I, I don't I don't really get it. I'm like, Jesus. This is a disaster waiting to happen. And it, it actually did happen. Uh, God. And that's not even the darkest thing that happened on set, you know, so. Oh, this movie is bonkers. Um, what's well, <laughs> your uh, Ennio Morcone? There are so many options. Uh, the music mm. of this movie mm-hmm. is iconic. I love all of it. I love, you know, the, the Scarecrow, Tin Man, and Cowardly Lions uh, play on the If I Only Had a song. I love those. Yes. I love the We're Off to See the Wizard, the weird Munchkin, Yay, She's Dead song. Always kind of sit weird with me, but I liked it. <laughs> munchkin land what in the hell <laughs> i don't know um but my all-time <laughs> favorite music moment in this movie has got to be if i were king of the forest oh good pick good pick <laughs> it's so optimistic it's the first time in the entire movie you see the cowardly lion have some hope and be proud of himself and that dude in the fluffy hat just crushes those dreams so fast <laughs> <laughs> But I love it, you know, just him proudly singing, being all regal and the weird rhymes he's making. It's such a funny song, but it's also so hopeful. It's like, we're going to be okay. We're going to do this. It's so good. And the the Cowardly the Coward Lion has so many like moments like that where he's like questioning. He, he has like existential crisis uh, throughout the film. And I love that. I love when they get tired, when Dorothy gets tired and he's like, 40 winks, son. Sound good to write about now. <laughs> oh my god, it is it, he's great. Um, uh, and, and the little bow on the top of his head, just cool touch, just great touch. You know, this movie's so weird, makes so many weird decisions that that I love. That's a that's a great pick. I I kind of had like a top three, um, but ultimately today the one that was kind of sticking with me was uh kind of a kind of a darker. It's it's a darker piece of score, but it's also got some redemption to it, and that's uh the the music that's playing uh, during. It's called Dorothy's Rescue, so of course it's during Dorothy's Rescue. And uh, at first, you know, you're you're in this castle, you're you're you got this witch who's just all time evil, and she's like, "You see that? You that you have that long to be alive, you know?" And then of course our our three our three you know stooges come to the rescue, right and and they're trying to save Dorothy and, and, and that music is, that music's like really good. And I felt myself while I was watching the movie late last night, I felt myself kind of, kind of lean up a little bit, kind of like, Oh man, what is this? You know, this is some, this is some pretty exciting shit. And uh, for the most part, I was just kind of smiling and like, what the hell is happening? But then I, I kind of leaned up and, and my, my attention, uh, my attention was grabbed uh, at, at a different level at that point in the film. And, I think it was because of the music. Uh, so hats off, hats off to that that little that little piece of score. It's really good. It's a nice touch. Yeah, the score, the songs kind of overshadow the score. I think, but the score they is do. really good. Yeah, that's what I was trying. I, like, I was like, man, this 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 you know soundtrack is amazing. You know, these these like songs that were written directly for this movie and are iconic and they're unforgettable, uh, but the score is, is good. And it's not just filler score. It's like for the, for 1939, it's good. Yeah. One moment I almost included was cause it's just so creepy. The wicked witches guards chant when mm. the yeah, guys yeah. show up at the castle and they're like, Oh, we, it's so creepy. <laughs> like, oh, what's we. going on in this place? Oh yeah. That castle is like, Oh God <laughs> damn. I want no part of that. Yeah, it's awesome. It's a total tonal shift into absolute hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do really. Yeah, you go from Emerald City to 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 hell there for for a bit, and uh, you forget that you were just looking at like colorful mushrooms and fucking, you know, fake trees with like yellow shit hanging off of it. You're like, oh, the tonal shifts in this movie are pretty impressive, and I think that's a big reason why it's 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 lasted as long as it has. Is it it. It's still, I don't want to say believable, but it's, but it is, you know, it's the story that's, you know, it's, of course, it's super fantastical and almost like, almost like the equivalent of like what we have in like comic book movies now with how, how well it pops, but it, but it is like 
sort of feasible in this kind of a realm. And that's cool. You know, it's not, it's weird, but it's not too weird to be like, okay, this is some David Lynch bullshit. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like coherent, you know? Um, And that's cool. I agree, man. I agree. (laughs) Yeah. That's, I, I, I would, this, I bet this film has influenced so many fucking weirdo filmmakers yeah. Like, just go there and yeah, David Lynch is at the top of that list. I yeah. 100 guarantee that. Yeah, The Wizard of Oz, and then for animated movies, uh, Alice in Wonderland. Just like, oh, I can do whatever I want. Okay. <laughs> yeah. God damn. No, I found out that while they were making this, Walt Disney was also making his Wizard of Oz, and mm. he and uh, Mayor, instead of fighting about it, we're going to combine their resources and make a MGM Disney joint adventure hybrid animation live action wizard of Oz, oh, but God. Uh, for whatever reason i think it was like they couldn't agree on a budget things fell apart disney abandoned the project and mayor went forward with his disney disney was like wait you want to really spend money on this and he's like well yeah we have to and disney's <laughs> like no, no no that's not how we do shit right now you know <laughs> we don't we, we we just we just want to profit man <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome oh, so fuck fucking walt and louis oh i want Nothing to do with those two in the same room. Dear God. <laughs> I, ego alone. I, I'm surprised like the inflated weight of those egos didn't collapse that building. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh yeah, I don't even want to know. I, I this is probably the most rambling, like shut the hell up type conversation uh you could you could witness. Well, I'm but, surprised uh, like Disney yeah. didn't just go straight for the like, well, the, the flying monkeys gotta look like Jews, right, Louis? And Louis's like, I'm Jewish, Walt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Walt. Yeah. Maybe that's why they didn't, yeah. Who knows? That might be it. That might Walt, Louis might have like had one meeting with Walt and it's like, I want nothing to do with that anti-Semitic son of a bitch. <laughs> God. A uh, couple of freaks. Uh <laughs> Oh God! What? <laughs> uh, I think I, I think one of the most fascinating questions about this movie is, is who wins it? Philip Seymour Hoffman Award. Who gives the most entertaining or best performance for you? Without a doubt, this goes to Margaret Hamilton. Damn! I win Judy Garland. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I get it. Judy's given a, a Hall of Fame performance. She's awesome. But Margaret Hamilton. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I think I went more legacy than than actual in the film. I think you're right. Well, she's. I read into it. She was a really, really nice woman. Like she and Judy Garland got along really well. Like she was like the mother Judy Garland ever had. She stood up. Like Margaret Hamilton stuck up for her all the time. Like they were really tight. And she scared so many people. She had to, the actress Margaret Hamilton had to go on Mister Rogers' show just to prove to people she's not really a witch. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I heard um, a lot of the kids that that play Munchkins were like frightened by her on set. Yeah, that's yeah. That, probably that's just couldn't crazy. take off that goddamn paint and be herself. <laughs> but um, it's man, and yeah. can you imagine witnessing her catching on fire? You're like child, and you're on set, and you're like, oh, I'm here to work, and you just see this lady catch fire, like. You're, yeah, you're a little girl. You're everything. You're in the lullaby league, and all of a sudden, an actress is on fire. <laughs> like, I can't imagine that shit. Um, no thanks. Yeah, no thanks. But the, the character of the Wicked Wish is so neat because there's an argument that can be made that she's not even the bad guy. Like, what exactly does she do that's so evil? She shows up in town after some crazy Kansas tourist kills her sister and steals her shoes. And then Glinda's like, you're going to take that from this green bitch? And Dorothy's like, I don't know. And the Wicked Witch is like, I'm going to get those shoes. <laughs> like, that's all this is about. <laughs> she does nothing inherently evil. She just wants those shoes back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I-, I thought the same thing initially. I was like, man, Dorothy really fucked up here. <laughs> you know? she, yeah. she, she fucks shit up in this, this fucking fake ass land you know <laughs> Munch, munchkin land just got rocked and it's because because uh you know oh that's such a great bit of the movie though is when the house is spinning and it's like such a great little special effect but um yeah i i thought the exact same thing i've never really had that thought until watching it last night i was like i i don't think the witch is so bad 
you know, it's kind of like you raise your hand, like for, to answer a question and you know, you're going to get slapped on the wrist, but you're like, I, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. Why is she so bad? Cause she's scary looking. But then you look at Glenda's actions in this movie. And what does she do? She is manipulating all the events in her favor. She has her, both her enemies, or actually all three people standing in the way of her having the throne of Oz are gone at the end of this movie. Both Wicked Witches and the Wizard are gone. So Glenda used Dorothy to take power in Oz. And I bet her reign was bloody. <laughs> I don't know. Just Glenda does not seem like a very good witch to me. Anyway, Wicked Witch, great performance. Margaret Hamilton's terrifying. Uh, and I appreciate her sticking up for Judy Garland. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I hear that. And I, I like that that reasoning. Um, that's really cool. Uh, she's so good. I, I love some of the bits where, uh, where they're chasing. Um, they're chasing our four main characters, you know, through the castle you go that way you go that way you know she's she's playing she's playing quarterback there at the end it's it, it's really really good stuff she's yeah it's a, it's a good rangeful type uh type performance judy yeah i, I wrote judy down just because I, I she's amazing she's amazing she does everything you want like, need actress to do in a, in a film and at that age and knowing what you know about how they're just fucking abusing her with you know like emotionally physically and with drugs um and there's a few times that are like in my opinion if you if if you know all that stuff and you care to like learn about that i understand if you just want to watch the film and have some fun and be entertained but if you want to like go into go into some research about judy garland and about this movie specifically it's it's just scary some of the lines that she has you know where she's like literally like what is happening right now and she looks like she's in a daze it's like she's in a daze. Judy Garland's in a daze right now, um, and often was worked like worked to death, man. You know, uh, they would they would film from five a.m. till seven p.m. and they would demand that Judy Garland be there the entire time. At one point, uh, uh, I can't remember if it was Louis or Victor. I think they both actually uh, both actually at one point did this. Uh, she went into a laughing fit because she was she was like on speed while while making this movie, Judy Garland, and she went into a laughing fit and got like slapped around, like literally slapped in the face because they're like, "Hey, you need to do this scene, and it's not supposed to be you just laughing the whole time." She's like, had no control. She had no control over what was happening, and for her to still churn out this performance as Dorothy Gale is like as a child, as a kid, it's crazy. Like, just not many people could endure that. And uh, it's it's what carries on the rest of her career, and it's just so brutal and so sad. Uh, I, I think it's important to kind of have context when you're talking about Judy Garland. Um, she's you know one of the biggest stars ever, but it came with a fucking price, um, and that's that's extremely sad. Yeah, man, I'm I totally get it. Uh, she is the most memorable performance of the movie. She you know it's a film that started her career. And, you know, like I said, just kind of over, like was hanging over her her entire life. Um, and I bet, you know, a lot of the abuse she suffered on the set of this film stayed with her forever. Uh, certainly started her uh, drug problem. That's for damn sure. But yeah, uh, yeah I, I'm not going to. Yeah, there's no wrong answer here. And you're, you're probably right more than anybody. Uh, yeah, Judy Garland. I'm glad we did that episode, like learning about her on, on Filmgasm. I'm glad we did that. Uh, Me too. It's important to have that context when watching her movies because it really does answer a lot of questions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well said. Um, here we go. Best scene in the movie. Roger Deakins Award. What do you got? Um, my favorite part of the film is the first meeting with the wizard. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a God, such a good scene <laughs> <laughs> just from you know dorothy crying outside and the guy being like crying for her and be like I'll, I'll get you a meeting with the wizard i'll just wait right here and <laughs> they go in there and they're all like have no clue what to expect they're all freaked out cowardly lions barely moving they're like pushing him forward i love that <laughs> he tries to leave several times and then we meet the wizard and it's this giant bulbous green head surrounded by smoke and you're like what and he's, I love when he screams at Lion and Lion just faints. 
And then Dorothy stands up for him and he screams at, at Dorothy. And then like, I love when the lion gets super freaked and just decides, fuck this, I'm out. And bolts out of the room and <laughs> leaps through the window. <laughs> so good. Such a good, such a good touch. I love that he actually goes through the window. Yeah. And when Scarecrow like stumbles, calling him like your majesty. Oh, wait, your wizardry? Like freaking out there. <laughs> your wizardry. Yeah. Uh. It's, it's awesome. It's hilarious. You're not quite sure what's going on with the wizard. You just know something's not kosher here. <laughs> but it's yeah, the first time you're watching that, you're like, this is majestic, but also really freaky and really funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's like a very like I think you have to be a certain kind of a veteran when it movie watching movies to like understand that scene, understand what they're going for and what kind of tone they're going for. Cause it is, it is, it, it is unsettling in a very funny way. Yeah. And I love, I, I love that we get that. And then later we get, we get the curtain scene where he's like, they, they find out who like that this is a hoax and, and it's so good. <laughs> All, all along, all along, you know, at the beginning of the movie, Glenda says, you know, oh, he's a he's a good, but very mysterious, you know. It's like, okay, <laughs> sure, Glenda. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she knew. Man. She knew the whole time. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that, that motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, I love that. That's that's a great great bit. And I laughed my ass off when the cowardly lion jumps. He's <gasps> yeah, just the noises he makes and. The shattering glass, like oh, that probably hurt pretty bad. <laughs> just to get out of there, uh, it's it's great that that scene of him running down the hall is awesome. It's like a patient, good, funny scene. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Yeah, yeah full blown yeah. Scooby Doo running down the yeah. hallway. <laughs> I love I, I love all that stuff with those characters. Uh, you know, Tin Man, Cowardly Lion, Scarecrow. Like when we first see the Tin Man, and he's leaning like he's Michael Jackson. You know, one way and then the other way, and they're like, oh, oh I stay up. Or when the Carly Lion wants to wants to run the other way, his legs are moving really fast under him, but the Tin Man and the Scarecrow are are holding him up. Like that's just funny <laughs> shit. That's that's funny at age ten, and it's funny at age you know fucking fifty. So uh, I think that stuff is is timeless. Um, uh, I knew I knew what my favorite scene in the movie was probably before I even watched it, just because I'm so blown away, and it takes me back to all these things that uh, like just floor me when it comes to art, whether it be, you know, like I would put it up there with like when I first heard like Sergeant Peppers by the Beatles or, um, or, you know, watching certain filmmakers, like the first time I saw uh, Pulp Fiction and I, I, I heard, ah, 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 you know, on this, the soundtrack starts playing and, uh, those those things that just stand out to you in the Wizard of Oz. It's the beginning when it changes from black and white to color, and she arrives in Munchkin Land, and she knows she's not in Kansas anymore. Mm-hmm. I I absolutely love the transition from black and white film with the with the kind of kind of weird. Uh, I think it's called sepia tone that they throw over it that gives it kind of like a brown, like washed out type feeling to it which i also really like but when it goes to the technicolor it's just like whoa 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 what are we watching here and um it, it's it's so fucking beautiful and i watch this movie on hbo max as i don't own it but it made me want to buy like a 4k fucking you know blu-ray 4k edition of this film because it's so beautiful and that transition is fucking incredible and we hear uh, Judy Garland sing over the rainbow, right? Uh, while it's still black and white. And then when she's entering Munchkin land and she's like, what the, f- where the fuck am I? You hear over the rainbow playing and inst- the instrumental version of, of over the rainbow is playing. And it's kind of creepy and kind of yeah. weird and unsettling. And uh, you start hearing the Munchkins like, hur, 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 you know, making these weird noises. And then finally you see the bubble coming of, of, of this, this witch. And, it's such a cool introduction to a world. And I, it reminds me of all the things that I've like fallen in love with instantly. Uh, those pieces of art where you're like, Whoa, where your mind it's, it's like that moment where you feel like, you know, your, your, your pupils are like almost dilated. Cause what you're looking at is like, what is my, what is my 
you know, earthly body uh, fucking experiencing right now. And that's happened to me, you know, multiple times with movies. There's definitely movies that stand out where I'm like, wow, like that is so fucking cool. And takes you back to that childlike wonder that you have for, for, for art. And it's certainly happened with music where you're like, oh my God, what, what is this amazing, amazing sound that, that I, I've been missing out on? And The Wizard of Oz like carries that at the beginning of the film for me and always has and always will. And it's, it's something that we saw when we went to the Academy Museum uh, when we were in LA. They had a TV, uh, a TV, like a giant fucking you know, wall with these projectors and there was a bit where they showed that transition. And I was just like, God, that is, that is powerful. Like that is true power uh, with, with movie making, with filmmaking. And so I, I always kind of knew that was my Deacons just off of a, and Deacons would be proud. You know, it's a, it's a moment of, of camera use and lighting and uh, using your technology to your advantage. And I, I love that about this movie. Yeah. That's, that's a great, great choice. It's one of the most iconic shots in cinema history. Yeah, um, yeah. Two things. One, I would have loved if there there's some reality out there where Dorothy does walk into Oz and just whisper to herself, "Where the fuck am I?" Yeah, <laughs> me too, man. Me too. Well, yeah. Like if you and I went through this, you know, I mean, I I'd be like, dude, what? What did we just? Did we eat something wrong? Yeah. Like what happened? <laughs> what was in that milkshake? Like what? Yeah. <laughs> um. And also yeah, just a, the fuck. <laughs> I find this hilarious. This film came out in 39. The color television didn't come out until 1953. So mm, mm. this film was broadcast on TV, but you how nobody could tell <laughs> the difference. If you didn't see it on the at theaters, you didn't see it until it was on like you know NBC or something. And then you it was black and white. Like, how would you know? How would you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. What a great, that's hilarious. That's a good observation. Like there's people who are just like, I love this movie, but they were missing like the biggest part. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. Like you saw the wizard of Oz at the movies and then you tell your best friend, but he missed it. And then you just keep telling him the wizard of Oz is the most amazing movie. You'll never believe it. And then he watches it on TV and he's like, that was an interesting story, but I don't get why he was so jazzed about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what drugs was he on when he was at the theater? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. But yeah, yeah, that's that's great. That's, a, that's an awesome choice. It's a yeah, great scene of the movie and gets us started on this epic journey of you know finding your place in the world. I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. Finding your place somewhere. Fuck. Uh, <laughs> so good. I yeah, I I really like this movie. Uh, for me, for me, it's an eight out of ten. It's not like one of my favorite movies of all time or anything, but I I respect it highly and it is entertaining. And has some great stuff going for it. Um, and I'm glad we got to talk about it here on this show. It, it, it feels right to finally do this movie. Yeah, man. For me, it's a nine. I I do love it. It still holds up. And I just, it, it just makes me happy. It's a, it's a comfort food movie to me. It, despite the cloud of dark shit hanging over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no. I mean, let's be honest, man. A lot of our favorite things there's something bad that went down to get it, to get it, to get it done. Uh, and that, that's, that's frustrating. You know, I mean, we just did, we just did Coco, right. And Ernesto says it best where he's like, look, man, you know, if you want to be real about what it takes to make, make great art, you know, it's, it's kind of true. It's kind of, kind of sad, but, uh, but it's kind of true, especially in the, the world that we love to live in, which is uh, the movie world. So, you know, it's just, just, just reality. Yeah, good good throwback. <laughs> yeah, God, Coco. Just doesn't feel it doesn't feel right that we get to do Coco and Wizard of Oz two weeks in a row. I'm I'm uh just in heaven. Just in heaven right now. Yeah. And next week is the fucking Oscars. Yeah, the actual Oscars, uh 94th Academy Awards. Um yeah, ne- next we're gonna be doing something real special. Uh it's, it's gonna be cool. I'll talk about it here in a second. Tomorrow. On sneak preview, uh, I believe covering three films: uh, X, Deep yeah. Water, and the and the outfit. All three, hopefully. Uh, the outfit is proving to be a little challenging to find, and uh, to manage our time, X is going to be the priority, and Deep Water if we can get to it. Uh, 
but yeah, we're going all out for X. You know, we did a Ty West movie last week on Filmgasm, so X is our priority, and uh, it's getting insanely good reviews. So I'm I'm excited. Yeah, yeah, I definitely want to try to check out X. It, it's it's a movie that looks right up my alley. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm excited to to hear what you guys say about that one. Um, and then Wednesday is fucking The Punisher. Hell yeah, on Filmgasm, awesome movie. That's gonna be great. Yeah, it was um, um it wasn't my original pick for the cycle, but um you suggested it. And the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, you know what? I want to watch the Punisher. So yeah, yeah, that became my new pick. And I watched it earlier tonight uh today. It's not great, but it's you know what? Fuck it, it's fun. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely not a, a cinematic achievement or anything, but it is fun as hell. Yeah. So that'll be a blast. Yeah, no, that's that that's a that's a, that's a good film, guys. And that's kind of like going back to our roots of just doing something fucking weird and out there and not great, but not bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, on Friday, uh, beyond the bad, uh, Laura Croft, Laura, 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 whatever you want to, however you want to say it, uh, Tomb Raider, uh, Angelina Jolie. So this movie has not aged, aged too well. Uh, nobody really likes it anymore. Uh, I think people who like it probably play the video game. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think people who like it just think Angelina Jolie is hot. Honestly, that's because like, apparently it's not. I don't think video game fans cared for this, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it's a terrible fucking movie. And I, but you know that's that's what we do on Beyond the Bad. It's not that's not you know it's it's not the masterpieces. It's it's the dog shit we walk around so we can get to the good stuff. <laughs> but. You know, exactly. Exactly. It'll be, it'll be fun to just kind of shit on this movie for a while because it's it's a long time coming. This was one of the first Caleb suggested when we came up with this show. So Tomb Raider, be nice to get this out of the way. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Like just kind of fucking chop, chop off, you know. <laughs> just get it, get it done, execute it. Um, and then so that, Friday, be on the bad. And then uh next Sunday, the actual Oscars. Of course, uh, 94th Academy Awards, we're going to be doing an episode uh, that day, releasing an episode that day. We'll release it well before the actual ceremony. Um, so hopefully people will try to listen before the ceremony because we are both going to do our predictions for the Oscars. We're going to go through every category. We're going to do it pretty quickly. We're not going to try to spend a ton of time talking about, you know, you know costume design or like that we're just going to kind of give our two cents on who we think is going to win each category or what's going to win each category uh and we'll line ours up because we've done this now for what this will be our third fourth year of doing this where we kind of eat to see who gets more right uh so we'll kind of do that on the show and we'll have it kind of set in stone and uh we'll see which one which one of us connor and i uh get more get more correct also we're not just going to do the predictions we're going to both bring some stuff to the table that we think would make the Oscars a more effective and more quite frankly, productive uh, show all around. Uh, I think it's no secret that the Oscars have lacked some kind of uh, pizzazz the past few years and have slowly gone down and down, down the with uh, with the viewers and people care less and less. So I I think we're going to have some stuff to say about, just the state of the Oscars and what we would like to see from it. And uh, hopefully in the future, you know, our, 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 our wishes will come true. <laughs> we can dream. We can dream. But until some young blood who actually wants to affect change gets into the Academy, it's going to be more of the same shit, more empty promises, more forgettable movies, and a lot less being in tune with the general public and the people who actually watch this shit. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I think it. I think it is a, a pipe dream, but it's still fun to talk about because you never know. Maybe one day, you know, Connor and I will be able to get our foot in the door and <laughs> and, and and make some make some moves, make some changes, and you know, get get that Spider Man No Way Home into the Best Picture category. You know, do like that, so people will care. So yeah, we'll, we'll be talking about stuff like that, doing our predictions, just having some fun, trying to keep it light. Uh, for actual Oscar Sunday, because we both are going to be hanging out, watching that ceremony together. Uh, then we're going to 
do a sneak preview, you know, recap of, of what happened at the Oscars. So, you know, it's, it's just one of those days that we both get kind of amped up for no matter what happens, you know, um, if it's parasite or if it's green book or shape of water or moonlight doesn't matter, we're going to be up for it. Hell yeah. Can't wait. It's bread and butter yeah. of this show. Yeah. Yeah. Straight up hundred percent. And you know, the films that, uh, get nominated and win are now movies that we could do on this show in the future. So, you know, the power of the dogs and, you know, the nightmare alleys and the drive my cars and Belfast, like those movies are now possible Oscar Sunday episodes. And exciting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, we could do fucking free guy if we wanted to now. <laughs> we could, but we probably won't. <laughs> Uh, that's great I love it man well you know thank you for listening guys this has been a really fun episode uh, talking about music and Wizard of Oz it's been great uh, us this week follow us on uh, Instagram Twitter uh, you know like us on Facebook uh, it's always always at Filmgasm and uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow